My name is James Bank, and I am uh, director of the Center for Multicultural Education. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 17th book talk in the Center's book talk series. If you turn on the back of your program, if you don't have a program, please let one of the research assistants know you don't have it by raising your hand. If you turn to the back of the program, you will see a list of all the distinguished scholars who participated in our book talk series. First announcement. The 20th anniversary of the Center for Multicultural Education will be celebrated with a special seminar featuring Professor Linda darling Hammond on November 9th, 2012. Please hold the date. We will be sending out a hold the date announcement on Monday, but we don't like to get people confused with two things happening. So we waited till this event was over before sending the hold the date. November 9th, the 20th anniversary of the center, featuring Professor Linda Darling Hammond of Stanford University. Another important thing will happen at the 20th anniversary of the center. We can hardly believe we've been around that long. At the 20th anniversary of the center, we will also launch the center's next major publication, the Encyclopedia of Diversity in Education, a four-volume work uh, that, that's being published by SAGE this month, as a matter of fact. Uh, this four-volume vo reference work is not being launched until November because of Linda Jones Hammond's hectic schedule. We, Because she's a personal friend, she, like Shirley Bright Heath, has been a friend of the center since it began. We wanted her to, launch, to be there at the launch. The Encyclopedia of Diversity in Education will be published this <coughs> later, later this month. We have flyers on it. Uh, on it, if you want one, you can take one as you leave. Uh, it's for librarians, so please give it. If you take one, don't keep it. Uh, it's not a book for individuals. It's a book for your li for librarians. Uh, individuals don't buy full volume works. Uh, so please, if you take one, please give it to your librarian. Uh, the University of Washington Library has already ordered it, but so, but if you're from other libraries, please take one and give it to your librarian. Um, <laughs> it takes a village to organize a successful book talk. No one can do it alone. I would like to thank the research assistants in the center who worked very hard to make this book talk successful. Adewali, Adikali, and Tao Wang. Let's give them a hand. Raise your hand so we can see who you are. Of course, Tao. They worked very hard to make this. Uh, it does a lot of logistics getting the speaker here, so forth, getting the books ordered. It's, it's a lot that you don't see that happens. Those of you who've organized events know what I mean. So that those men have done a wonderful job. The dean of our college, Tom Stridicus, strongly supports the center in many ways, and I'd like to acknowledge his support. The Book Talk series, what is it? The purpose of the Book Talk series is to stimulate dialogue among our faculty and graduate students within the College of Education and across campus. We have many people across campus at this book talk about ways to increase the academic achievement of all students, help all students develop positive racial attitudes, and become effective citizens of a democratic society, and to learn about the histories and cultures of the various racial, ethnic, language, and cultural groups in the U.S. and around the world. Another purpose of the Book Talk series is to involve teachers and school educators in the outreach activities of the center. <coughs> Our procedure for today. Professor Heath will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. We will then invite your participation in a question and answer dialogue. And after the Q&A, Professor Heath, who just arrived from London, uh, she's a busy woman. After the Q&A, Professor Heath will sign copies of her book, Words at Work and Play, Three Decades in Family and Community, the 38-year follow-up to her classic book, Ways with Word, Life and Work in Communities and Classrooms. Professor Heath 
was a world-renowned linguistic anthropologist <laughs> with extensive research experience in learning communities outside of teacher-led classroom instruction. She has done extensive research on oral and written language, youth development, race relations, and organizational learning. Since 1987, Professor Heath's primary research has been with young people in un under-resourced neighborhoods who learn entrepreneurial and community building skills as they help create and sustain positive learning environments that contribute local, cultural, and economic resources. She is widely known for her work with young people in the township of Johannesburg, South Africa, and with economically disadvantaged communities in the U.S. She is particularly interested in documenting organizational structures and communication practices that surround everyday learning and progression in complex task achievement. Professor Heath is the author of the classic book, Ways with Words, Language Life and Working Communities in Classrooms, and co-author with Milbury McLaughlin of Identity and Inner City Youth Beyond Ethnicity and Gender, which received the coveted Bromire Bra Award in Education in 1995. By the way, this award, a lot of awards don't have any money, but this one has big money. Um, <laughs> so it's a reward you'd like to get. She has authored many other books and more than 100 articles and book chapters. <laughs> Professor Shirley Bryce Heath is a dear friend and, and long friend and supporter of the Center for Multicultural Education. During its 20-year history, this is her fourth visit to the center. She, when we, in our struggling days, she helped. She came to give a speech with, you know, the, and she always she gets a little money. Uh, she gets her travel. <laughs> she also wrote a fine article on informal learning for the Encyclopedia of Diversity in Education. It's a fine piece. It's worth the encyclopedia. <laughs> please, please join me in welcoming my dear friend and colleague, Professor Shirley Bryant Heath, back to the center in the University of Washington. Thank you, Jim. You always make us feel as though we're about 25 feet tall. <laughs> and, um, you know, and make us really aware that we can't stand up and slump our shoulders at all. Uh, I am delighted to be back on the campus of the University of Washington and to be connected with the center, uh, a place that's held a very particular role in the history of learning uh, in the United States and more recently, uh, much more widely around the world. I'm especially delighted to be here to talk about the new book, uh, which I must say I'm very glad to have finished. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jim said to me this morning, now how long did you work on that? I said, Jim, 30 years <laughs> after the earlier one. So uh, it's a little hard to believe, and I was teasing him about the fact that sometimes I can't quite believe that. But um, it is done, and I'm happy to say it's, uh, if you put the two together, it's only about half the size of the original one, and that's quite purposeful. Um, but sadly, we all know that it's very, very rare that people read books this long anymore, unless they're fiction. And um, I felt so desperate uh, about getting this book into the hands of people and having them read it that I cut and cut and cut and cut and made a great enemy of Cambridge University Press in the process because I wanted it to be something you could sit down and read on a bus ride or on a train or uh, pick up in, uh, in, a week of re in a week of reading. And um, so some of you have already read it, and I thank my long friend Sheila for that, and I'm delighted that, uh, that some of you have already had a, a sense of dealing with it. Um, I was saying that I really wanted this to be a talk, and I'll talk um, a shorter time I suspect than Jim might have projected. Because um, the way I want to approach the comments today is to ask the questions that if I were in your position, I would want to know before I spent the time reading even a short book like this. 
Um, and um, so I want to start, however, by reading um, just the, a passage that um, I'll pick up a little later in a reading um, from this book. Um, my feeling as a scholar that I should always uh, read from my books is one that uh, first uh, hit a, a very rough road with David Tyack. Back in, night, in the late 1980s, um, when we were both at Century, David asked me to come to his class and uh, give a talk. And I went and I sat down and I had my book and I opened it and I opened it at the beginning of the uh, first chapter and started reading and David was quite surprised. I could tell by looking at him that wasn't quite what he'd expected. And we talked later about how he felt when I read the, this opening. So you may remember it. A quiet early morning fog shrouds rolling hills, blanketed by pine green stands of timber, patched with fields of red clay. As the sun rises and burns off the fog, the blue sky is feathered with smoke, let go from the chimneys of textile mills. And he said, I just never think of scholars having that much appreciation for their writing. And I said, Jim, I am a professor in the English department. <laughs> As, uh, you know, it, the, the fact that I'm an anthropologist doesn't mean I don't want to write so that people will remember it uh, and get caught up in the story. And uh, so I, I'm going to continue. Uh, bucking against the braces, as I did with David, and I'm going to read just a bit before I tackle the three questions that I think uh, you might be asking. The part I'm reading is from the second chapter of Ways With Words, just a paragraph, and it reads um, in the section where I am describing the families of Tracton. Miss Green, whose diabetic condition grew steadily worse, had three daughters, the middle daughter, Xenia May, a large girl who had social and academic difficulties at school became pregnant at 14. Because her mother could not see after her, she had been messing around with some boys and got herself pregnant. It was agreed by all that Xenia was too young to take responsibility for the child and the grandmother could not, so Miss Green's oldest daughter, Rosa, who had lived across town, came back to keep the child. Shortly thereafter, Xenia's sister, only a year younger, then she became pregnant, and soon the oldest girl had two babies to take care of. All of Tracton lamented the pregnancies for an unusually long period, primarily because the grandmother could not care for the babies. But once the babies, two boys, arrived, they were immediately accepted in the neighborhood and accorded the same status as all boy children. It's a very different status from the girl children. Now, I'm going to pick up with Miss um, Green in the new book, for those of you who haven't read it. Um, I found Jerome quite by accident. I knew that Xenia May, daughter of the Green family in Tracton, had had a child when she was 14, and the child had been given over to her older sister, Rosa. Their mother suffered from severe diabetes, and she was nearly blind uh, by the time Xenia May entered elementary school. Xenia May and her mother lived just up the road from her grandmother, who, though crippled with arthritis, was an energetic, lively woman, a favorite of all the Tracton children. I had seen Xenia May's son, Jerome, a few times before Rosa moved to New York City in the mid-1980s. A handsome child with a winning way he seemed keen to please adults and adored Rosa. When they moved away to New York, I lost touch. A few years later, I heard that Rosa had died. I wondered what had become of Jerome. His mother and grandma had no idea. In Chicago, during the mid-1990s, when I was studying youth organizations there, a 14-year-old in a theater group where I spent a lot of time seemed oddly familiar to me. He was fluent in Puerto Rican Spanish. When he spoke English, pairs such as pen and pin carried the same vowel, and he had a very southern way of saying a whole nother. <laughs> Several weeks after meeting him, I asked if he was from Chicago. He quickly said no. When I asked how he came to be in Chicago, he met my query with a laugh and shrugged. Just lucky, I guess. 
I went after the drums that day with what seemed to me a special vengeance. Months later, when I was driving some young people from Jerome's theater group to a Chicago suburb for a performance, we were all talking about places we had lived and our favorite music. I mentioned growing up in the South and liking country music. A series of groans came from everyone in the van. <laughs> On the way back downtown that same day, Jerome sat in the front seat with me. While the others were talking among themselves, he leaned over and asked, for himself. <laughs> when I told him, sort of all over, grandmother in Virginia, foster family in North Carolina, high school in Florida, finally back to South Carolina and North Carolina by way of New York, he grew quiet. Me too, he said several minutes later. I didn't get what he said. And so I asked, in the South? Where? He explained that he had been born in South Carolina, lived there for a while, then New York, and now Chicago. Lots of places. My mom, then my aunt, couldn't take care of me. So I went with foster families, and now here. We said no more that day, but eventually I pieced bits of his story together and learned that he was Zena May's lost son. And then it goes on to talk about how I had kept up with her and her other children uh, over the years and uh, tells the story of um, Jerome. Uh, and I want to pick up with um, the fact that I once got a uh, picture of, um, there's someone who knew Rosa, of uh, Jerome, and I had given it to Zena May. Now in 1994, Jerome was 14 and living in Chicago with Tia Maria, a caregiver he had found more or less on his own. His birth mom and half-siblings were in Atlanta, and I had the bizarre fortune of being able to connect them. Those of you who read the 1990 article, The Children of Tracton's Children, will remember that I talked about Zena May and Sissy in that article on finding Zena May, I mean, working with Zena May in Atlanta in the high rise projects. The next time I went to Atlanta, I got Tia Maria's permission to buy Jerome's plane ticket and take him with me. None of my audio recordings included him as a child, of course, but they gave him a glimpse into Zena May's life as a child and the home life of his half siblings in their early childhood. By 1994, Zinia May and her three children had been living for several years in a small, single-family home, happy to be away from the high-rise apartment she had moved into when she first came to Atlanta. After the initially strained and gradual reunion of mother with the child she could not remember ever having seen beyond the photograph, Zinia May took me aside. She asked me if I would drive them all back to the housing projects where she had lived during her first years in Atlanta. Puzzled. I agreed, and later in the weekend, we drove slowly back and forth along the streets near her old high-rise apartment building. Zena May's younger children, Donna, and the twins, Melvin and Marcello, remembered the place well, and Donna giggled their way through the song played by the ice cream truck that came through the housing projects every afternoon as she told stories about cockroaches the size of a mouse. Jerome looked around and asked his mother, where did you go shopping back then? She was still obese and walked with difficulty, having had two toes amputated because of diabetes. I could sense that Jerome was trying to imagine his mother with three babies making her way down and out of that apartment building and through the neighborhood to a grocery store. Jerome asked Donna, who had just turned 11, what she did for fun. I wondered how she would answer. For I knew she was already hanging out with kids who played truant, shoplifted occasionally, and stayed out later than her mother thought she should. Donna shrugged. I interjected, have you thought any more about doing stuff at the YMCA? <laughs> I knew the twins, Melvin and Marcelo, now nine, spent lots of time there, having figured out through a friend at school that by being at the YMCA, they could play games, have access to a swimming pool, and take lots of out-of-town field trips on the YMCA bus. Zinia May had no car and had never learned to drive. Every day after school, the twins took the public bus to the YMCA, but Donna almost never joined them, preferring to be with her friends. Her mom now worked at their neighborhood church's daycare program as receptionist, and she wanted Donna to come be with her after school, an option Donna flatly rejected. Donna told her mom she had to go to friends' houses to do her homework. 
Once Donna entered the sixth grade, Zinia May almost never saw her except in the mornings before school and during summer months when she came home from her girlfriend's house to get some clothes, tease her younger brothers, and then head out again. Jerome was quiet on the plane going back to Chicago. But several weeks later, he asked, how come I'm different? We talked about how much he'd moved around, all the options he'd seen, and the fact that he had the good fortune of being bilingual, musical, and a clown in front of audiences. And my skin color? He didn't wait for me to respond. I knew he had noticed how light-skinned he was in contrast to his half-siblings. He laughed and said, Maybe getting tossed around from place to place and not having a real family ain't all that bad after all. He winked at me. Um, and the, um, the, the book goes back and forth like that, but it's built so that you don't have to have read um, Ways with Words. You can pick up the characters, but as you reconnect back to Ways with Words, you'll know sort of the beginnings of those characters. Uh, uh, through the years. <laughs> now, let me um, turn to what I think would be um, the uh, three questions you might ask about somebody nutty enough to say, you know, I'm, I'm a bit like George Eliot in some ways. Um, she wrote at the end of Middlemarch this additional section in which she asked the question, who can easily quit young lives after being long in company with them and not know how their, how their endings are, and uh, uh, that's sort of been my motto all, all these years, and I did find it impossibly uh, difficult to leave the young lives, and I have to say that even though the book is out, I'm still on the phone every week, seeing them everywhere I go, et cetera, et cetera. But the first question I think you might ask is, what do you think we learned in the first book that still holds in this book? And there are three things that I think learned in that first book. I hope you told. The first is that um, culture is not at all synonymous with either race or class as a necessary ax axiom. It may well be a corollary under some circumstances, but it is not an axiom as it is often put out to be. The second thing I hope the first book led you to consider is that language socialization matters, along with literacy, of course, but it's never going to be anything other than intensely interdependent with time, space, models, materials, especially, and this is one of the most critical messages, of, I think, of the new book, <coughs> Well, I don't think of myself as purposely putting out messages, but it's especially the materials that are connected to play and the ideology of parenting. So language socialization is always going to live with time and space, models and materials, and ideologies of parenting. That's what makes the difference. The third thing I hope you took away from the first book was that spirituality and a sense of what people believe are strengths in themselves and in others are inseparable. That the extent to which we believe in others and believe in ourselves, in the first book I think argues, will always have some sort of spiritual dimension. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about a spiritual um, dimension. And that by that, I mean that there is a strong sense of connection to a positive force, which is greater than the single individual. And therefore, that spirituality leads people to have the kind of determination that Jerome had, and that's a determination to overcome adversity. To do everything from believe you can be 
whatever you want to be. But you can't be whatever you want to be if you don't decide you're going to be the best at whatever you want to be. And that takes a deep spiritual force uh, for people to carry that, carry that forward. Um, and it's one of the reasons why cross cultures and across time, adversity and spirituality have been very close cousins. So that's what I hoped people would learn in the first book. In the second book, what's different? What it wasn't that didn't hold. Uh, and to prepare you for that, I want to read just a little piece from the um, ending of the 1996 epilogue to this version of Ways with Words. Because that 1996 epilogue proved that I was wrong in the 1983 epilogue, because I had said, these interdependencies are so powerful around language socialization, they'll hold no matter what. Well, realignments of time and space, shifts of intimacy and social structures, and new sources of entertainment and consumerism have influenced classrooms as much as communities since Ways with Words was first published. Language as both tool and target of socialization reflects these changes deeply and subtly in form, content, and use. Only by rethinking our ways of looking and ways of learning and teaching can we break habits of expecting families and communities to be and do the same now of the language socialization of their children as they did in the past. Social connections, engagement with work, and group responsibility by and with the young now must characterize more organizations, not fewer. Exploring creatively the need for social connectedness of institutions such as schools and youth organizations, as well as the workplace, offers us ways to create and tell new stories. As we do so, we have to acknowledge that what seem limits or losses can be beginnings as well as endings. And I wrote that knowing full well that I would go ahead. I didn't at that time project for 30 years uh, to write about those beginnings because I knew it was so radically, radically different in 1996 than it had been in 1983. So what is different in the new book? Uh, the first thing that is different is that spirituality and a sense of ethos around something that is greater than the individual uh, and linked to what the individual feels he or she can do that would be possible has fallen away. Um, every week, um, reviews in the Washington Post, the New York Times, etc., will provide some book which is about um, the downslide of religious membership. Um, no one has yet really talked much about spirituality except Bob Putnam in his recent book mentions that to some extent, but um, it, many he would argue, as others do, that where you've lost church membership you've gotten an incline in uh, commitment to ethical um, uh, options, if you will, or op ethical courses having to do with the environment, having to do with animal rights, having to do with water quality, having to do with air quality, having to do with political causes, civic engagement, etc. But um, what happened in the course of this book is that during the 1990s, Corollary with big money, um, the the growing sense of greed as a national norm, and um, many other things that came with that, um, trust and faith in something bigger than the self, um, just didn't hold, couldn't hold in that context. 
And so people came to have the belief, especially young people, there's nothing I can't do or have. It's out there for me to take. Now that's an important part of the idea. It's out there for me to take. Very, very different from what was there in the 70s and 80s. It's out there for me to work for. It's out there for me to earn. By the 1990s, with the big flush of money that we had at that time, and seemingly endless opportunities. And we were constantly surrounded with stories uh, of multi-million dollar contracts for 27-year-olds who were English majors on Wall Street. I mean, now, and, you know, three days last week in London, and um, the New York Times coming out here, there were articles about how bad it is to be a humanities major, an anthropology major, or a philosophy major. I don't know how anthropology got in there, but that's going to matter. <laughs> I, was I was really upset by that one. Okay, the second thing that is very different is um, the death of loyalty. Um, throughout the 90s, and certainly through the 2000s, um, their loyalty has died. Skip Gates predicted this um, back in the late 1980s. Um, because he felt that loyalty was something, regardless of whether it's loyalty to a spouse, loyalty to a cause, loyalty to a god, loyalty to an institution, had to be um, very much based in the idea that you're loyal to something because you feel yourself as an important part of its contributing potential, and that together you can do more than one of you can do alone, or any one of the individuals can do alone. And along with that loss of loyalty has come a dramatic increase in serial monogamy. Uh, partnering now, we know that uh, young people, uh, approximately 60% of the young people are not marrying. Uh, they're simply partnering, um, generally monogamously. Um, but that in itself is um, a very open uh, indication of the loss of loyalty, but it, it's very much true of older years, and right now the second highest divorce rate is among uh, parents of college age children. Um, the third thing that's different is the um, shift from uh, print and formal instruction as uh, primary sources of information, knowledge, or skills. And that shift away from print or formal instruction has been to other uh, structured symbol systems and images. Um, that has come along with the growth, of course, in multitasking. And um, that ability has been accompanied by a decline, however. I mean, there are certainly benefits from multitasking, as there are detriments. But there has been a commensurate. Uh, uh, decline in visual, spatial, and haptic competence of young people. In other words, as you get more of these other forms of literacy, uh, along with some other uh, concomitant changes, uh, there is a loss of um, uh, the use of the hand uh, and the digits and the forearm uh, for learning about the world. And most of us don't think about that, but it turns out it's very important because we are um, the highest in the primate chain, if you want to think about it that way. And uh, all primates depend very much on this part of the body for learning and knowing. And it is um, very much attached to a core center um, of the brain. And uh, but that, with that loss, then comes a loss in visual spatial competency. <laughs> I'll give you one example. There are very few schools now that are seriously teaching penmanship. Uh, there are very school, few schools now that understand that it, with kindergartners and first graders, you never give them a crayon or a pencil. You must always give them a big crayon, break it in two, so they have to hold it like this, as opposed to like this. Uh, and this is a way, essentially, to feed into the brain the symbol structuring development. And, but that's not being taught to primary teachers because 
uh, and why bother? Because we're not doing um, serious treatment from um, script any longer. And we're not paying a whole lot of attention to print. But the assumption is, oh, you're going to learn to use the computer. Don't have to worry about your bad hand. The third thing, the new, uh, the fourth thing, I'm sorry, um, that, um, uh, no, it is the third thing, the third main thing. There were three things I hope you remembered from Ways with Words, three things you're going to learn from um, that you didn't expect, and I certainly didn't expect from Words at Work and Play. Um, and uh, then uh, the final thing I want to uh, make a point about is the fact that Ways with Words had a lot to say about school practices and their need to be informed by and involved with uh, home and real world habits and beliefs. Um, how does this new book contribute to our knowledge on this matter? And I would say not, not a whole lot that's direct line, uh, because quite purposefully, the, the Ways with Words was called Language, Life, and Work in Communities and Classrooms, and this is called Three Decades in Family and Community Life. So I'm looking at that con those contexts where 80% of the time for learning and, and sleeping will go on. We're now down to, it depends on the person you talk to, 19 to 20% of the kids' learning time <laughs> in school. And that's it. And the rest of the time, um, so much of it, it has to do with uh, structure, et cetera. So, um, what's happened then in the in the context? Does that mean that uh, schools are, are damned? Does it mean that kids are damned? Is that no learning is going on? Absolutely not. Um, but it's harder to see what's going on, and you have to work hard to see it. Um, the Brits call this uh, pro-am development. Uh, it's called professional amateur development. And it means individuals decide, I'm going to learn something. I got really interested in that. I'm going to figure out how to do it. I heard you say the other day you collected bugs. I'm interested in bugs, so I go talk to you. I go online. I go to a library. I find books. I find the librarian. I decide I'm going to do it. I set up a, I don't know what you call it. You do an aquarium for bugs. There must be some fancy name for it. But in any event, um, what's happening is that people are doing all the professional things, which is what people on the job do, when they are told, your job description is going to change, and you're going to have six weeks to gear up for this new position. You have to learn it on your own. And you may have two or three professional workshops, but other than that, it's basically up to you um, to go online and do the course. It's exactly what's going to happen now that Stanford, Harvard, and MIT are offering open course access. And one of the things that Alan Garber said the other day, when the, one of the commentators in the Boston television, I was there when I was in Boston, that news broke that day, and someone interviewed him and said, hey, wait a minute, Harvard and MIT have never been known for being particularly generous. Uh, and you guys are going to do this free? Where are you going to get money? What, what's coming in? He said, well, we're going to do research. And I said, well, on what? Well, how people learn online. Now, how that's going to pay off, I don't know. I've been doing it for 15 years, and I haven't seen it pay off a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to be very interested in how Alan Garber, in fact, I'm going to make an appointment and go see him and find out how I expect that to pay off. Uh, <laughs> But it is a very, very serious question, because that <laughs> is already the norm in the workplace. Those who have jobs, those who want jobs, are having to learn on their own. Um, uh, Portland State now offers platforms for people, uh, largely um, the immigrant population, who know that they have to sort of scale up in all sorts of ways. And the only way they get to do that is by being themselves, they have to become pro -ams. And we become different kinds of pro -ams, sometimes at the same time, but certainly uh, throughout the life course. <coughs> I apologize, I think I've just spent too much time on this one. But this voluntary lo learning um, growth, you know, adjustment and so forth is going to continue. 
and it's going to continue in uh, many ways that we uh, currently have no way uh, to predict. And schools um, in some nations have already adapted. Uh, Finland has adapted, where for the most part kids go to school three days a week, and the other days they are out learning on their own. They're learning under project development. And which is one of the central messages of the second book, is that with the loss of work uh, uh, visible to young people, and with the loss of play, with interactions at home, uh, what happened was that um, people, the kids learned, went out to learn on their own. And um, the Finns have decided to take great advantage of that. There's a good reason there at the top of the FISA list. And um, we, we are not. Um, <laughs> so, I want to um, um, close in by and leave the questions to you um, by turning to the very ending of this um, this book, um, the new one, um, and um, it, it centers around. Um, I come back to Jerome, as you might expect. Jerome, Eduardo, and a group of their friends had gathered for dinner at Tia Maria's on a Sunday afternoon in 2009. Both Jerome and Eduardo were now teachers in local schools attended by children of families who had immigrated from all over the world. They asked me about the book. How's it coming? What's it going to say? I'm writing about how easy you guys have it today compared to the way your parents and grandparents lived, I said. Guffaws and protest arose. And Tia Maria turned to me and asked, Why do you say that? The professorial side of my nature jumped on this question, and I responded with a long answer. The two generations who came before you kids around this table had little choice in education, housing, or jobs. They lived through the violent struggles of race relations before and during the civil rights era. Changes in the world economy took away their jobs in the mills, their hope of making a living as a small farmer and most important, their sense of possibility. They had to pick themselves up after the economic times of the early 1980s. When they moved to find work, they had to remake themselves. Tia Maria looked down at her hands. Sounds like immigrants to me. The young people looked at her and waited for her to go on. In a soft voice and odds with Tia Maria's usual commanding presence, she told what she remembered of the journey that had brought her as a child and her family to Miami. My papa had been a storekeeper in Puerto Rico. All of us kids worked around the store cleaning, running errands, and helping out. When he got it in his head we were coming to Miami, my mama went around her little flower garden and kissed every one of them flowers. In Miami didn't treat us so good. Papa thought some relatives there would take us in, and they did for a little bit, but that didn't work out. So we lived in a shed in the back of a warehouse where he got a job cleaning and watching the place at night. Next thing we knew, he wanted to go to New York, where somebody told him he could find work and a place for us to live. We took the bus. I was nine years old, and I'd never been to school. No English, no books, no money. In New York, things got a little better, but the Puerto Ricans there resented newcomers. We were scared of the blocks, and the crime, dirt, noise, and police. It wasn't easy, I'll tell you. I went to school but never finished. Stayed home to take care of Papa after he had his stroke. So Mama could work. Silence settled over all of us. We had thought we knew this woman who seemed so secure, successful, and solid. Tia Maria announced it was time for cake. Jerome stared out the window. The next time we got together, Jerome turned to Tia Maria in the middle of Sunday dinner. Thank you for telling me what you did about you. It's helped me think about my students. They come from Somalia, Boston, Turkey, all over. So much of what I think they ought to know, they have no clue. I feel like I have to start their lives all over again in my classroom. What is it they don't know that most surprises you, I ask? Jerome reeled off bits and pieces of operational know-how for getting along in everyday life, how to wake up in the morning, how to make change, where to get buses, tickets, how to keep track of the school books, how to ask questions when they didn't know what the teachers wanted, how to get assignments on time, in on time, how to make friends, how to keep from insulting someone in the hallways. How do you learn these things, I asked insistently. 
You know what puzzled us? Did Eduardo added? I never thought about these as things to learn. It's just what you pick up. Jerome broke in and figure out by watching what's going on around you. <coughs> Tia Maria reminded both boys, "You had somebody around you doing that stuff. These kids don't. Somebody has to be there to copy. A mama, nanny, uncle, teacher." Another thing, you boys and you girls too, you knew that if you didn't do what you needed to do, nobody else was going to do it for you, and you might not get any dinner. She winked at them, and Jerome jumped up and gave her a playful hug. So that's how the book ends. Um, so I'm going to turn now to you and ask uh, for you to ask. Not like the UW audience I know. <laughs> and then Debo is going to uh, pull the mic around. Oh, yes. So, yes, what please. did you, I'll start it off, what did you learn? What is the biggest thing you learned from this? Well, all three of the things I mentioned, um, I learned. Um, the other thing I learned was that um, um, the nature of change for organizations like museums, libraries, um, botanical gardens, after school programs, um, adult after school programs, uh, those changes are going on, but they're very invisible. And I learned how they, they provide a network, but they're not themselves networked. And we're always talking about building a network, but in most cases, those networks came about by people doing word of mouth. And um, there's a lot of word of mouth evidence of that in, in the book. Um, um, so I think that the three things I pointed out to you, plus um, that one other aspect, was, um, those were the, probably the most startling uh, to me. Um, of course, I, I was um, very much aware during the 1990s, even by the end of the 1980s, that the opportunity for young people to observe work in the home or take part in work. And I'm talking about things like preparing a dinner, um, making a shopping list, um, baking things from scratch, deciding on the menu and the decorations for the table for grandma's dinner, um, uh, cleaning up the garage, um, building a treehouse in the backyard, repairing the boat, um, fixing the um, uh, flat tire on the car, and those kinds of things fell away because they were now um, paid for. They were outsourced. So what happened was that work became outsourced from homes, and with that outsourcing of work, because people were making wages and salaries where they could pay for that, um, young people no longer saw work as what they had to do. Me, change a tire. Are you kidding? And parents would say, no, I tell him to clean his room and take the trash out. I said, oh, so you want me to be a garbage collector? And uh, me, right? Uh, and there, no distinction between uh, jobs and uh, work and what uh, and chores. Donald Hall, Hall the great poet, um, once wrote a wonderful article about why there's a big difference between um, the way we feel about jobs and work versus the way we feel about jobs and work on the one hand and chores. Uh, who enjoys chores? They're called that because they're chores. <laughs> and they're redundant. They have to be done again and again and again. Clean the refrigerator out, take the garbage out, um, clean your room, etc. Et but the loss of play, uh, if people say to me, what over the years, would you see as the greatest loss? I would say it's the loss of play. Certainly the loss of the visibility of work hurt in all sorts of ways. But that but play um, is, I mean, there's no free play. Um, we are lost to nature. 
Uh, there, there is a play that is always taking place. They're what I call in, uh, the supervision of intimate strangers. Children are being raised by people who are much less educated than their parents um, in childcare centers and maids in the home and nannies and coaches and karate teachers and all those people who fill the 27 on average hours per week by 12 and 10 that kids spend outside of school in committed time and that, that parents either pay for or that's provided in the community. And But that is not free play. And there's a difference in what happens in free play that is very definitely linguistically based, but also um, very connected to cognition. Yes? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to explain this to my children. Can you stand up and speak in your fifth grade voice? <laughs> <laughs> He has a mind. That's okay. Yeah. Well, anyhow, I was just imagining passing this whole narrative of loss onto my children and my grandchildren. How am I going to help them understand that the world, understand the world they have to adapt in? Uh, so I'm just interested in your thoughts about what are the nodes of opportunity and the uh, and you know, you know, basically, what am I going to tell my children about how to raise their children? Given this narrative of loss, you just laid out so Not a lot. Um, <laughs> that isn't what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I know. However, I do have three very practical suggestions. Um, one is that, um, depending on how old your grandchildren are, you make a rule that you never do parents and children at the same time, that you will take the children to be with you and your partner, and you you then give them the book, and when I said you inspect your life to make sure it's, it is very different from the life that they ordinarily follow. Uh, <laughs> I fell into this a practice with my own grandchildren. As I realized, I, I went to visit um, my son's home when his first child had her first birthday, and I calculated they spent more than $12,000 on that birthday party. And I had just come from Cabrini Green, from a daycare program there. I was in that party for 25 minutes. I went upstairs and threw up for three hours. And my daughter and I came up and said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. I think I have a virus. But I knew exactly why I was throwing up. Uh, and I resolved then. I would never have parents and children together. Parents can come. Children can come. And, but the, and I'm fortunate in that my daughter-in-law's parents are are still alive and healthy. Uh, but um, just simply because I am such a work fanatic I mean, in terms of gardening and repairing and blah, 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 it, and the, the kids think they've died and gone to heaven. But you got to start them by age eight. So I, I'm not very fond of little kids. Um, <laughs> so they have to be old enough that I can have a conversation with them. Uh, the second suggestion I would make is that uh, to the greatest extent possible, you immerse them in uh, your particular pro-am passions, that they learn your pro-am passions intimately, <coughs> whether it's stamp collecting, collecting antique toys, um, or gardening, or uh, visiting uh, specific river systems, uh, that they know that there are ways other than the ways that their parents do things. And I, um, in part because of being an anthropologist with all these families and having to follow the idea that I didn't tell them what to do, I had to sit by and watch it, I take the same position with my son and daughter-in-law. They know that when the kids come to be with me, that they are living a very different life. And um, they know also that they can't live in the kind of life I live more than about three days at a time. Uh, and uh, it's that, that's the second suggestion. And the third is that um, you try to find out as much as you can about the um, likely voluntary learning pursuits of your grandchildren. Uh, many times people communicate by Skype or by phone, and that's not about face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, Skype, you can call it face-to-face, -face, but whatever. But, but you, you get them to 
talk to you about it and when you are visiting with them uh, if you do that you, um, you you see that as a really important part of your time with them but the, my best my best answer is to say you know I, I, I want the kids to know me as a person uh, not as my son's mother and that's fine they know that they don't, but as a person and I'm very different and uh, I do things that are quite different uh, but I just never talk about values. I never talk about their their values or how they do things. And I ask them to tell me what they've been doing. And you know, they go on cruises and they do all sorts of things. And, and you know, I ask them to tell me about it. What did you learn? Where'd you go? Who'd you meet? What kinds of things did you do? Etc. Yes. So. So can I take that question into the committed time space? <laughs> and think about if we're in this era of pro-am expanding and voluntary expertise development expanding um, and you have multiple organizations trying to figure out how to be supportive mm -hmm. in concert with each other what what do you see as promising in that space as models that you've seen what what are the concerns you have as as people try to like provide coordinated support for learners or or resource these voluntary pathways the first problem is to assume that it has to be coordinated or that it has to be collaborative or it even has to be in parallel. Uh, it can be entirely disparate and should be. All of us have interests that are very disparate. Some of us are specialists in the various kinds of spinach. Uh, some of us are specialists in, uh, as well in various kinds of software. So we have very disparate pro-am interest. Um, so I've advocated in the places around the world where I've worked diligently for the last 15 years to get this through um, that people don't try to coordinate and they don't try to coordinate in the school. It's in the kid's head. What you do is you ensure that families and communities have unbroken learning environments, that they see themselves as moving across terrains of learning and that they can pull from you never can predict now what do i see that's most promising is that yes uh the country of australia and the country of the uk um particularly in isn't systematic yet in ireland and scotland have shifted from talking about education outreach education programs at museums they no longer have such things they have programs of learning and participation. But I was able to get to, because of some earlier work there, get to people and say, is there any evidence that marching school kids through the museums to look at Damien Hurst's work is worth it? It cost the school district a bloody fortune. The kids hate it unless, you know, unless they happen to get to kiss the girl in the back seat of the bus or whatever. Uh, you know, and the kid who threw up on the back seat of the bus, you know, hates it even more. It's, you know, watch it. There's no evidence that is longitudinal. Why would you spend all that money? That doesn't make any sense to me. Is that the way you're investing the museum's money? And uh, at that point, I had connections to people in the Department of Treasury, so they, they, they didn't want me asking those kinds of questions, and of museums, and so they just shifted to learning and participation. And the Tate Modern is doubling in size, and the whole back section is going to be in learning and participation, and they're having a big conference this fall, in which they're bringing together everything from the Royal Shake Company to all the Tate museums to the British Library, uh, the British Museum, and um, I don't know, they're putting it all together. And I'm and people who have festivals as opposed to festivals. And these are places where you bring all the scientists in and they are able to set up on the, uh, in open spaces um, uh, interactive programs for kids and parents. And you know, I've spent a lot of time studying these and the parents are just as involved. Well, the other thing is libraries. Libraries are now enlisting um, theater programs, not in a coordinated way, but could you help us out, to come in and do readers' theater with young children in reading groups and um, to move with that um, right on up into having young people um, be part of their boards for ordering books and writing reviews and um, taking the, the YA novels that young people are writing as extension of their reading of YA literature um, that they're reading to one another, that you bring critics in, 
uh, work with them, and a lot of this is very short-term exposure to other kinds of people, like um, professional literary critics. Uh, <laughs> where we're having the problems are in rural areas, and that is very difficult. And they have the real key is in civic engagement, because those are the places that are really threatened by water quality, deforestation, uh, loss of the uh, um, animal resources, and those are places that are tough, but we're getting more and more young people involved in those community pursuits, which means that they're having to become pro ams about the life habits of the oak or the life habits of you know salmon, et cetera. And they're becoming more involved. And the wonderful thing about these is that they're so cross age. Um, in Mendocino County, the most active one is led by a woman who's 88 years old. It was a journalist all her life. Didn't you know a darn thing about water or salmon or rivers or anything until she decided to move to rural Mendocino. And um, but the same is true in Montana and um, it, there are some there are some states where nothing is happening um, uh, in rural areas. I have to say quickly, uh, places like St. Louis, um, where the, the you know you've got a school system that is in deep trouble. Um, that there's a lot that's going on there with the art library, the science library, the music, the museums, the music, and now across the country, we're starting Health System of USA, uh, which has, which I think holds huge promise. Uh, it probably doesn't hold as much promise as they're promising, <laughs> but it holds promise. And for about five years, I've been doing research on that, and one of the things that's critical is the multiple symbol system stuff. Can you be heard without the mic? Maybe. Yeah, just, just, uh, just a quick follow up on that. I was wondering if you'd speak more about young people and voluntary engagement with music and the arts. Oh. How that intersects with the story. Well, the, with music, it, it, was, it has been wild for me because talk about unexpected, as Jim asked. I didn't expect it. Um, in fact, when uh, I was working at the New England Conservatory of Music, when Dudamel and Abreu and El Sistema um, and the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra came, and they were talking about USA Today, and Deborah Borda was there from LA Philharmonic, I said, guys, I'm an anthropologist. I can tell you this isn't going to work in America, because in Venezuela, the kids don't have 30 different options after school. Here, they do. And so what are you going to do to make that possible? Um, if you, the only way it's going to work is if you start with young kids, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they pushed ahead, and one of the deals, Sub Rosa, that Dudamel made with, with L.A. Phil was he, he really wanted this to happen. He would come, and he, he signed a short-term contract to make sure that... And, but already in L.A., there's a program called Harmony, um, which I'd begun studying in with a Brown student. I was teaching temporarily at Brown at that time. And that, that was amazing because you would have one room with 10 members of a family from Korea living in that one room, and they would do anything to get their five and six year old every single day. Now, one of the tenets of the El System <coughs> program, as you know, is that you have to uh, practice or be in rehearsal 20 to 30 hours a week. <coughs> now, Americans say, huh? Are you crazy? Well, they're starting them young. And that's the way they're holding in many places, not all. Um, it's, the difference is phenomenal. Because, of course, when you think about music, and obviously you must be a musician, so this will be no use to you, you are, particularly when you're working in orchestral ensemble, you're reading multiple symbol systems at the same time. You're reading musical notation, mathematics. You're, if you're in the string section, you have to or any section, and the conductor, etc. So, and you're also being told to emote in ways that may not yet be in your vocabulary, especially if you're a non-native English speaker. And all of these are going into the most under-resourced communities, many of them in, in connection with bilingual schools. So, uh, it is happening, and um, uh, it's it's moving. Uh, last week, the bylaws and so forth. So, it's really worth watching. And um, my sense is that there was such a felt need that it came at the right time. I think we were next, Wayne. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, 
So here we have 30 years between books. And um, when I think about it, I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between in-school learning and out-of-school learning. And clearly, education policy and what's happened in school has just dramatically shifted in many ways. There's the loss of arts and electives and the upper, upper level. And recess. Of, the loss of and play, play at the lower levels, right? So did you, did you name it. either, did, did any of this come out in the, in the more recent round of work in terms of the discussions you had with folks, or do you have any reflections on the shift in that relationship and seeing any changes that's, that's doing for the out of school uh, context? I have been very tried all my life, though I'm not often interpreted this way, um, not to set myself up as a critic of school. Uh, we need schools. There's all sorts of evidence that we sh we are always going to need a formal educational system and programs uh, dip in and out of of, in, of formal education or formal instruction. Um, you go and take a particular computer class, or you go take an art class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so no, the book does not point this out. It points it out in terms of that subtle fact you just noted being taken note of by the young people and their parents. And um, a kid like Jerome uh, finding his way to a theater group, but um, that theater group and the fact that he started drumming back in New York with one of his foster families made a difference. And when kids grow up in families with music, it turns out that one of the most significant uh, portenders, if I may use that word, of effective learning with symbol systems for young people with music is the fact that they are able to take the instrument home. Would I have expected that? No. And I don't think that's an answer, but everybody's been making a big deal of it. But it, there's something about it, because for many under-resourced kids, that's the first time they've ever been given something precious to take care of. And you can't leave your violin on the front steps the way you can leave your school backpack. And, uh, you, you know, because that has huge repercussions and you're using it so much it just becomes a part of you. Um, so I see these as, as I said, it's a seamless series of ways of learning environment uh, from which uh, every learner is going to pick and pull, you know, connect on their own, bring other people in who can help them connect, et cetera, et cetera. And that you, you see this, um, what Lee Shulman used to talk about as communities of learners. And those communities of learners uh, have this spiritual um, ethos. Uh, the new book on El Sistema, uh, it really talks about the spirituality, uh, if you want to call it that, of, of Rehu, uh, which is that uh, the music and the art should be a human right. Uh, it's been a human privilege since the very beginning of it, all of our archaeological excavations. Humans, for some reason, thought out art, created it. There's got to be a reason that it's going to keep going. And it, uh, when I used to do my work in language policy, I would always note that if you wanted a language to flourish, you told it it couldn't be there. <laughs> the good example was in East Germany when they tried to repress all the minority languages. They flourished. When the walls went down and the West Germans said, yeah, speak your language, go for it. Yeah, that's great. Those languages began to die. So I, I don't think that's a direct corollary to schools by any means, because art in schools is always going to be very different from the 20 to 30 hours of, of play rehearsal the nine weeks before your school play goes up or your community theater play goes up. But there is something about something you can't have it. As humans, we'll say, I'll show you. And these five and six year old Korean kids and Guatemalan kids and El Salvadorian kids in Los Angeles and the bilingual kids in Colorado and the <laughs> poor, poor, oh God, just Charleston. Jim knows I have not quite recovered from the poverty level of the schools I visited in Charleston. Those kids are doing a system in one of the poor schools. And, um, it's, it is amazing that their parents come. It's a way of getting the parents connected. The one way to get the parents connected to the schools is having the kids perform in a way that the parents understand. So, long-winded answer, but obviously I'm very, very hopeful. And um, 
I was saying to colleagues here earlier that one of my big hopes is that more and more and more young people will see themselves as certainly caring and knowing and working in and working for and supporting and collaborating with schools, but more and more young people will, will see themselves as looking at what is it that allows these um, learning environments beyond the formal instruction to survive. How do they get initiated? It's like the, the commentator who asked um, the MIT guy, well, where are you going to make your money? I mean, everybody wants to know how are these things going to survive? But they are surviving. And um, that is, that's one of the areas of research I really hope people will pick up and run with. Um, the difficulty is they have to run with it interdisciplinarity and, and interdisciplinarily. That's a hard word to say. <laughs> I think I'm going to only take two more questions. Plus, he just flown from London. She got on a plane for many hours. She pulled here. So we'll just take two more because I want to save her voice. Um, I just sound like I'm trying for the bear. Yeah, she's getting back to Boston after she lives here. So let's take two more questions. Who's going to be the fortunate two? Yes. Uh, so. Do you need the mic or not? I'll, I'll try to speak loud in my teacher voice. Um, I, you made sort of a connection at the end uh, to immigrants, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your spirituality, the loss of spirituality, because you talk about the, the mills closing down, the, the, the populations are dispersed across the country, and I feel like with immigrants, it's a situation that, you know, this sort of loss of community that we've been thinking about for a while. And you kind of get to the, the you know at the end there. Right. Um, is, isn't there something to to learn from people who are working in different spaces and negotiating? And honestly, Jerome was bilingual, and you know there's a it, it, well, most of the kids are bilingual. Right. And most of the kids of this uh, third generation, um, <laughs> and they don't see it as a big deal. And that's because um, you have very high percentage of interracial uh, multi multi-connections with partners and friends. And there's a good bit in the book about that, which I think is going to be quite controversial. Uh, but uh, that's the reality, folks. It's just one that, that people over 40 are having a hard time taking. You know. um, and it's very different in different parts of the country. I mean, I'm not saying that there's a lot of black white marriage in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was last week. But um, overall, uh, one of the things that happened with the movement of these families out was that they came to work elbow to elbow with people that they found useful for their own learning and interesting in terms of their own learning. And many of them had things in common. Um, one of the most unusual things was lullabies. And they would share lullabies. And they would share uh, the song, the ways you put your baby to sleep. And um, what do you do with your teenager when he talks back? And um, how do you feel about the Catholic Church here, as opposed to what the Catholic Church was like back home? Um, and the, uh, one of the things, Eve Gregory, who's at Goldsmiths in London, is just about to finish a long study of the role of religion in immigrants in, in London. And she's finding that um, immigrants, as we all know, are, are trying very hard to cling to the community of their church because everything else in the society is trying to break them apart. Their work, their competition for social services, their housing, especially if they're reliant <coughs> on um, um, public housing personnel, uh, because in England, immigrants get moved kind of willy-nilly from city to city, especially the child soldiers and, and the sea seekers. <laughs> so it's very, uh, it's very interesting to see what happens in the book with the immigrants, um, Bernardo's mom and family, uh, she was from Mexico, the father was from, father's father was from Tracton, grandparents were from Tracton, and how that comes to bear, um, sort of through Bernardo, but without any particular help from his father, until finally the father gets caught up in the kind of ethic build, ethical buildup that Bernardo endorses. And um, uh, to me, that's a wonderful story. And I saw it repeated again and again and again of how um, young people were teaching their parents 
Because Bernardo makes them taste sad. If you don't want to come along, Dad, hey, you can get off the boat right now. Uh, you know, I'm going. And it was basically into organic gardening. And um, but, so it's a, but I'm sure that was a holdover from his mom, who died when he was quite young, but not before she had a lot of influence on him. Um, so I see many of the many of the immigrant communities trying harder to hold on to their um, religious institution because it is a place where you can be community and communal. And it's around food, it's around music, it's around art. It's um, and I have not been to single Nigerian church in East London. I have not been a single uh, church from uh, Bangladesh in. Um, uh, or a uh, sort of um, temple uh, from uh, people from Bangladesh that didn't have art, I mean, they were gender segregated, but art and music and the food uh, celebrations all during the week. Um, so, yeah, and that is a very job networking kind of thing as well, as it was here. Or is it, is here. So, good. We'll take one other question. Yes. Um, so we talked in our literature seminar a little bit about um, perhaps uh, whether you were or were not an intimate stranger in the lives of each family. And um, I was curious if that if you would share that view is that you were an intimate stranger in these lives of these generations. And if so, how do you think your presence um, perhaps changed their trajectory over time? I was not an intimate stranger in the sense that I was not going to teach them anything. If they came to me with a felt need and said, I want to learn how to do something, I usually said to them, I think I know why you want to do that. You think you're going to learn some money, right? That's what I said to Jerome, and there were a lot of them who were. So I made them recognize it was their felt need that made me play a kind of dictatorial role with them in very specifically delimited activities. Uh, I was their buddy, I was their confidant, I was a safe person they could go to, because my rule in ethnography always is that what A <coughs> tells me never goes to B, never goes to C, never goes to D, even if they're in the same family. And all the families know that from the beginning. Um, the exception is, of course, if I think if I could have predicted Tony's suicide, uh, you bet I would have done everything I could have done. Um, but uh, how did I affect their trajectory? I certainly affected it. Uh, as I say in the two appendices, uh, I think perhaps obliquely, because I was I was somebody who was always there, I was in and out. I was really interested in what they were doing, what they were learning. But it's the way I answered your question. I was sort of like the grandparent. Like, what is, uh, how, what is this business about bicycle? decorating. What are you doing? Where is this coming from? Tell me about it. I want to learn how to do that. Show me how. What paints? How do you learn to do that? So it was all about my ever wanting to learn. And that's a very different role from the way teacher education in this country, uh, and increasingly in England, sets teachers up. You're about teaching. You're not about learning. Um, and you, uh, you see yourself primarily as teacher. Um, I think it's debatable whether that's how how that plays positively or negatively, and uh, it's not important to get into that. But the the issue is that I was always a learner, and I was always writing it down, feeding it back, and then they could look at it, and they could compare it, and they could count. They didn't really do that very often. Um, that sort of thing. So um, I think that external learner is so critical. Tell me what you learn. Tell, tell, I tell me what I want to know. Help me. And I never ask questions about personal stuff. They, if they want to tell me, I'd listen, and then I'd ask questions. But I never said, so, you know, how are you getting along with your mom? And it's not my business. I'll find out if I'm a good observer. Yeah. Um, but I could ask about how you were learning to decorate your bike. Before we thank uh, <laughs> Professor Shirley Bright Heath for not only enriching us, but um, really her lifelong commitment to equality. Her, my, one of my favorite statements this, today, which remind me of Robert Moses, who said that algebra should be a human right. She said that art and music should be a human right. And I, I will certainly quote that, Professor Heath. Before we give her a round of applause, let me explain 
two things. To remind you of Linda Darling Hammond and our 20th anniversary on November 9th, if you'd make a note of that. To ask you to eat the coffee and cookies that the research assistants ordered. They always order coffee and cookies, and we have a lot of them left, so if you would <laughs> help yourself to that during the, this book signing. Then we will, we, we're going to scoot, really raise Professor Heath back to the back to sign books because please talk to her there. Don't try to talk to her, her up here because that's her next duty. I've asked her to, to uh, sign books. Uh, so let's give her a thank you for coming. So please.